Acts chapter 3, as we continue our studies in this book together. I want to read on to the fourth verse of chapter 4, and not as printed, just the third chapter. Let's hear the word of God. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us, as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, And you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets, as Samuel, from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you, to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Amen. And God will bless to us the reading of his word today. Now, we spent the last three weeks 
looking together at chapter 2 of the book of Acts. And we did that, spent three weeks there, because that chapter describes an event that is one of the key events of the Christian faith. We'd all agree that the coming of Jesus as a baby to Bethlehem, the death of Jesus on the cross at Calvary, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, are key events of our faith. And we remember them regularly and we glory in them. But what happened just seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection on that day of Pentecost is, I suggest, equally significant for us as Christians. For on that day, the Holy Spirit himself was sent to the disciples. They were enabled to speak to that vast crowd in the crowd's own languages. Peter was enabled to preach, pointing them unmistakably to Jesus, calling them to repentance and faith, and wonder of wonders, some 3,000 responded. In one day, they accepted his message, they believed, they were baptized, and the church, the spirit-filled body of Christ, was born. It was an important day. Last week, we noted the characteristics of those first church members. They were attentive to God. They were eager to learn from the apostles, to fellowship with God, to spend time together in prayer. They were attached to one another as they shared together and they met regularly together. And they were attractive to others as they enjoyed the favor of all the people and as the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Yes, it was an important day. The Holy Spirit came. The church was born. All now seems set for the spread of the gospel around the world. And here in chapter 3 and the opening verses of chapter 4, we read how the church almost doubled in size again from 3,000 on the day of Pentecost now to 5,000 just days later. The chapter begins with what I'm calling an amazing miracle. End of chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 43, we read that many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And here we have one example. Peter and John were going to the temple in Jerusalem for the time of prayer. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Apparently, there were three set times of prayer every day. At 9 a.m., at 3 p.m., and at sunset. We know the believers in Christ met together for times of prayer. We saw that last week. But it's interesting, isn't it, that they continued to go to the temple to pray as well. And as Peter and John were arriving at the beautiful gate, as it's called, they were asked for money by this crippled man who was being carried there and left there to beg. Now, the Old Testament said that there were to be no poor among God's covenant people. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 15. And what the law meant was that the Lord's people were to take care of the poor. They were to be open-handed. They were to provide for those in need. The fact that this beggar was there at the temple gate every day sustained by the charity of individuals, showed that the established church, the institution, had not bothered about him. It had closed its eyes to its God-given responsibility to care for the poor and needy. And notice this man asked for money. Well, that's what he needed, wasn't it? In order to buy some food, to stay alive for another day so he could beg for more money, for more food. That's what he wanted. He'd really no hope 
of accomplishing anything of usefulness. He really needed something far greater than money, didn't he? But I guess his thoughts seldom went that far. Peter called for the man's attention. The man looked at them, expecting, we read, to get something from them. I don't expect many people spoke to that beggar. And here was someone calling to him. He must have thought he was in for a good day. And then when Peter said he'd no money, I guess the man was very disappointed. But then Peter said he would give him what he had and told him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to walk. Can you imagine how the man must have felt? He'd never walked. He'd never been able to walk. He didn't know how to walk. He didn't expect he'd ever be able to walk. Then taking him by his right hand, Peter helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. He didn't need to be taught. He went into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when the people saw him and recognized who he was, They were filled, we read, with wonder and amazement. It really was an amazing miracle, wasn't it? For several reasons. The man had been crippled from birth. Luke tells us that in verse 2. And remember, Luke was a doctor. The man was over 40 years old. We know that in the next chapter, in chapter 4, verse 22. The man hadn't expected to be healed. He'd asked for money. He was looking for money. It happened instantly. Instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He'd never walked. His muscles must have been so underdeveloped and so weak. It was a complete healing. Peter says that in verse 16. And he began not just to walk, That would have been amazing enough. But he was jumping around as well. And, and he began praising God. He didn't just turn and run home to see his family and friends. He went into the temple and began praising God. It was an amazing miracle. No wonder the people came running to see what was happening. We can almost imagine them asking the same question that they'd asked on the day of Pentecost when they heard the disciples speaking in other languages. What does this mean? Here's a guy we've known for years and he's leaping around. He's gone mad. What does it mean? When you think about it, It was very like what happened on the day of Pentecost, wasn't it? An amazing miracle. Well, then it was these disciples speaking in in foreign languages, and here it's a man healed. An amazing miracle. And Peter, as the crowds were attracted to him, Peter gives an amazing explanation, issues an amazing challenge, and sees an amazing response. And you've guessed it, that's what I want to speak about. An amazing explanation. When Peter saw the crowd arriving, he recognized that they were surprised at what was happening. And they were wondering what powers he and John had in order to do that. And as on the day of Pentecost, it was a God-given opportunity to explain. And so as at Pentecost, Peter turned the crowd's attention from himself and from John to Jesus, in whose powerful name this miracle had taken place. Look what he says in verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. Remember, he's speaking to Jews in the temple. The God of our fathers has glorified his servant, 
Jesus. That's the same Jesus who was here, Peter saying, just a few weeks ago. And boldly, Peter goes on to remind them of what they'd done to Jesus. Verse 13, you hand him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. Peter might have added, just as I disowned him before a servant girl. Even though Pilate had decided to let him go. Verse 14, you disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released released to you. Verse 15, you killed the author of life. What Peter was saying was this. It's the same Jesus that was here then. You disowned him. You had him killed. But notice, but God. But God wonderfully reversed that fourfold rejection. God raised him from the dead. This Jesus, the one you saw crucified outside this very city, is alive. That's what Peter's saying. And he goes on, we are witnesses of his resurrection. We've seen him alive. We've seen him alive several times. Then notice what Peter says. It's by faith in the name of this Jesus, once rejected, now resurrected and reigning, that this crippled man whom you see and know was made strong. That's the amazing explanation. It's not our doing. It's Jesus' doing. And then Peter repeats it for emphasis in verse 16, this time separating the name and the faith which apprehends it. It is Jesus' name, that is, all that he is and all that he's done, it's Jesus' name, together with the faith that comes through him, that is, the faith that's aroused by him in those who grasp the implications of his name, which has given this complete healing as you can all see. The amazing explanation of this amazing healing is this. It's all to do with Jesus and the faith that comes through him. The same Jesus, Peter says, who you killed, but God raised to life. Notice in passing how Peter refers to Jesus here. He begins by calling him Jesus Christ of Nazareth, verse 6. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's God's Christ. He's the Messiah. But he is human. He lived and worked in Nazareth. He refers to him as God's servant, verse 13. Who first suffered and then was glorified. And the Jews surely would think of the servant of the Lord, the suffering servant in Isaiah. Then he was the holy and righteous one, verse 14. The Holy One of God was the title used for Elisha and Aaron in the Old Testament. It was a title used by the demons for Jesus. Righteous stresses the moral uprightness of Jesus. Suggested that Christians used it as a title for the Messiah. It may be simply underlining the fact that Jesus belonged to God in a special way. And then verse 15, the author of life, the source, the originator of life itself. Do you see how in just a few titles, Peter is proclaiming Jesus' uniqueness in his suffering and glory, his character and mission. It's all encapsulated in his name. This Jesus, crucified and risen, and faith that comes through him, is the amazing explanation of this amazing healing. But Peter has more to say. As on the day of Pentecost, having explained what happened, he proceeds to issue an amazing challenge. Now, brothers, this is what you must do. Actually, before he issues the challenge, Peter says he knows that they and their leaders acted in ignorance in the way they treated Jesus. Peter wasn't excusing them. He was echoing the Old Testament distinction between sins of ignorance and sins of presumption. 
although they didn't know what they were doing, God knew what they were doing. For what happened to Jesus was fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 18, this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through the prophets, especially that his Christ would suffer. However, their ignorance nor God's predictions excuse them. This is what you must do. They must repent and turn to God. Well, that's just what he said on the day of Pentecost, wasn't it? Repent means to change your mind, to turn around in your thinking, especially to turn away from sin and self-centeredness. Turn to God means turn to God. It means to trust in God. It means to have faith in God. You see, the two are linked. You can't do one without the other. You turn from sin and self, that's repentance, to God, that's faith. That's what they had to do. Yes, they were Jews. They were in the temple. They were at the time of prayer. Yes, they knew their scriptures well. But they were still, for all that, going their own sinful, self-centered way. They must turn from that and start trusting God. And when they do, Peter says, look, just look, just look what will happen. Verses 19 and 20. 19, your sins will be wiped out. Even the sin of killing the author of life. Think of it. Your sins will be wiped out. The, the word wiped out means to wash off or to erase or to wipe the slate clean. Ancient writing was done on papyrus and ink used had no acid in it. It didn't, it didn't bite into the papyrus as modern ink does. And to erase the writing, you just took a wet sponge and you wiped it away. That's what will happen with your deeply ingrained sin. It'll be wiped away. Second times of refreshing will come from the Lord. And the word means rest or relief or respite or refreshment. It's the positive counterpart to forgiveness. God not only wipes away our sins, he adds refreshment to our spirits. And thirdly, God will send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus, by repenting and turning to God. They are preparing the way for the time when God will restore everything. When Jesus comes again, they'll be counted in on God's plans for the future. Total forgiveness, spiritual refreshment, a place in God's future will be theirs when they repent and turn to God. Isn't that amazing? And it was all referred to in the Old Testament. And so Peter mentions significant quotations and allusions. He refers to Moses, Samuel, and Abraham. First, Moses predicted that a great prophet was to come. Then Samuel foretold those days. And thirdly, Abraham received the promise that through his offspring all people on earth would be blessed. It's all summed up, says Peter in verse 26. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Isn't that amazing? God was wanting to forgive them, to refresh them, to reinstate them, even after what they had done. An amazing explanation and an amazing challenge. And thirdly, as on the day of Pentecost, there was an amazing response. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 accepted the message and were baptized. Baptized is a sign that they had repented and believed. 
and 3,000 were added to the church. Here, verse 4 of chapter 4, 2,000 believed and were added to the number of believers. Isn't that amazing? 2,000 in one day? How do we explain that? Well, surely, although he's not mentioned, it's the working again of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Peter's persuasiveness. It wasn't Peter's oratory. He was from the north in Galilee. It was the Holy Spirit taking Peter's words as he focused them on Jesus, convicting the crowd of their sin, turning them around in their thinking, and leading them to faith in Christ. But did you notice, unlike on the day of Pentecost, there's another amazing response. The priests, the captain of the guards, the Sadducees, the religious leaders who'd been so opposed to Jesus, they were greatly disturbed, we read. And they had the two apostles seized and jailed for the night. Why? Why were they disturbed? Well, we're told, Luke tells us, because the apostles were teaching the people. And of course, that was their job to teach the people, not these apostles. They were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. It was quite unnecessary and it wasn't going to happen. And notice this, despite all the evidence, despite the transformation in these disciples, despite these thousands of people experiencing the power of the risen Christ, they refused. They refused to accept it. They were determined to get rid of of this sect, as they thought of it. And actually, it proved to be, to be the beginning of a very difficult time for the church, as we shall see in the coming weeks. But what an amazing response. 2,000 believed and were added to the church. The religious leaders began their persecution. Now, what is all that chapter got to say to us, what lessons can we learn today from that amazing chapter? Well, there are several, of course. I want to suggest three. First of all, can we not learn something about the place of miracles in the church's life? I have no doubt at all, I have no doubt the Lord can perform miracles today. His power has in no way diminished from those early days of the Christian church. And I know too that in places where the gospel has never been heard today, sometimes the Lord uses miracles to authenticate his servants and his word. But it seems to me from studying my Bible and from church history that miracles were restricted in the main to the time of Jesus and the apostles. I think it's significant that they're referred to in chapter 2, verse 43, as miraculous signs. They had the function of signposts pointing away from themselves. That was clearly the case with these two miracles, the speaking in foreign languages, the healing of the crippled man, the purpose of them both was to point people to Jesus. The speaking in foreign languages, well, it might have been good for the apostles, it left the crowd amazed and perplexed. This healing of the crippled man is good for the man. It led to the crowd being astonished and surprised. But it certainly attracted the crowd, didn't it? And it was the message of Christ. It was the message of Christ that led to repentance and faith. Second lesson in this chapter is about how how can our church grow? 
You know, we've been amazed that 2,000 people came into the church in one day. We said it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, of course it was. Only He can convict of sin and lead to repentance and faith. But notice notice how He worked. He worked through Peter and John. Just two ordinary guys who were committed to the Lord and who were on their way to pray. He worked specifically through Peter's preaching. What did Peter preach? He preached Jesus. Who he was, what he'd done. Centering again, as at Pentecost, on Jesus' death and resurrection. He called for repentance and faith. He promised forgiveness and refreshment. And he backed up what he was saying from the Scripture. What do we see in the church in Britain today? What do we do? Well, I'm talking about the church generally. We organize seeker-friendly services. We use big-name speakers. We think up snappy titles. We're careful not to preach for too long. We do our best not to upset people. We sometimes make the demands of the gospel less demanding. And in some churches, you know, they offer health, wealth, and prosperity. Come to Jesus and everything will be lovely. And what happens? Very little happens. Because surely we're relying on our methods, on our techniques, when all the while our confidence ought to be in the gospel. Do you remember what Paul said at the beginning of his letter to the Romans? I am not ashamed of the gospel, he said, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And I suggest we'll see our church grow when the Holy Spirit takes the message of Jesus crucified and risen and convicts men and women of their sin and leads them to repentance and faith. Are we praying for that? Or do we not really want our church to grow And the third lesson we can learn from this chapter is one about the importance of personal faith in Jesus Christ. I'm thinking again of the crippled man. We've talked to the children about him. Just think about him. He'd been crippled from birth. He'd never been able to walk. Every day he'd been carried to the temple to God's house. He wasn't allowed in, but he was right at the door. All he was interested in was getting enough money to live on. Very little to live for beyond that, but that was his life. And I was thinking about him and wondering if there weren't some of us like him spiritually. We've been coming to church for years. But we've never been able to walk before God. In fact, we don't expect to be able to walk before God. We come and we expect a word of comfort. We expect a nice thought for the week. Some of us expect intellectual stimulation. We enjoy singing the hymns, or most of them. We appreciate seeing our friends. But we know nothing of a vital living relationship with God through Jesus. And the gospel, the good news, is just that. God wants us to walk with him. He wants us to be in a personal relationship with himself. He wants us to be praising him, set free from all the things that hinder us. 
And as with this crippled man, that can be ours through faith in this same Jesus. I wonder if there's somebody in church this morning and you've been coming for years and you've never really seen it. Why don't you take our helping hand this morning as we seek in the name of Jesus of Nazareth to help you stand and walk. Won't you take our hand and come into this living relationship with Jesus? That's what you were made for. Why are we living at such a low level? Why not do that this morning? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you are alive, risen from the dead, and able to transform individuals, able to bring many into the company of believers. Lord, give all of us that confidence in the gospel as the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. Please be drawing many to yourself through your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.